Yeah, the word of the Lord is here for you again and is a powerful message for you. And I want you to pay attention as the word of the Lord control his servant this hour. God bless you and subscribe to it. Standing his prophetic end time program. Yesterday when um, I began, we considered a few things that it is important for us to know that God has a program for the nations god has a program for this region and that we must understand his program and then be in alignment submit ourselves to partner with what the spirit of god is doing and then we did say that god's prophetic program for the nations affect three categories of people number one the world of unbelievers number two the church and number three society hallelujah and then we took the subject of the global harvest yesterday night for a case study we examined a few things from matthew chapter 9 being our text jesus wept uh, well, it was it was it was a bleeding from his heart. He was moved with compassion, and it was that the field was wide, and yet the laborers were few. And he said, "Pray ye, the Lord of the harvest, that you will send laborers." And so I told us that every time there is a problem, as far as the harvest is concerned, the diagnosis based on scripture and in the mind of Jesus is the inefficiency of the laborers and the lord challenged us yesterday to be aware in a greater measure of the need to see sinners and to see souls saved this morning in continuation i want to discuss now the second level of the program of god that has to do with the church hallelujah so we yet we dealt with the world of sinners and unbelievers but the second assignment is to the church and this morning through the lens of scripture the lord wants to show us the kind of vessel that can be used by god especially in this end time it is a costly assumption to believe that god will use everybody it's a costlier assumption to believe that God will use every available vessel. The narrative until now is that once you are available, you will be used by God. That is not true. Even our world teaches us that it takes more than availability. When students write jam or write whatever exam, they are available to go to college, but not everybody makes the quota. The life of Gideon and the story of Gideon is a revelation that many can be called but in truth only few are chosen so we need to examine through the lens of scripture what kind of a believer is god looking for what kind of a man of god is god looking for what kind of a vessel is god looking for if it is true that god has standards and his standards are unbending his standards are uncompromising then it is important for us to not just be aware that God wants to move across the nations and not just be aware that we can make ourselves available, but we need to know God's standards so that we obtain grace to rise to that level that can make us great and prepared vessels. When it has to do with the program of God, God is not ashamed to declare his need for man as mighty and as great as god is he has been very vocal and outspoken as to the fact that when it has to do with the advancement of his purposes on earth he needs the cooperation and the partnership of man from the moment he made that divine declaration in genesis 1 26 down to 28 the bible says and elohim said let us make man in our own image and after our likeness he says and let them have dominion 
the moment that utterance came out from the lips of God it became scripturally incorrect for God to do anything on earth and leave man out of the program not because he does not have the sovereign power the earth still remains the Lord but from that statement he has come into an eternal partnership with man as far as his dealings on earth is concerned there will always be a need for a man it's important for us to appreciate this as an introduction this morning sometimes you see the bible express god as though he were helpless and you are tempted to ask god you are so mighty what is it about man that makes you so can't you push him out of the way and do everything yourself this was a contemplation of the psalmist hallelujah that should be psalm 8 the psalmist began to vocalize his contemplations and he says when i consider the works of your hands this and that and that all that you have created what is man that thou art mindful of him nor the son of man he says that thou visitest him he says you have made him a little lower than the angels the word there is elohim a little lower than god you have crowned him with glory and virtue and paul quoting that scripture in hebrews chapter 2 added a greater context to it you have set him above the works of your hands you have made him the zenith of your creation and that in doing so you left nothing that was not under his feet he says but we do not yet see all things under his feet so let us have it as a very clear understanding that for as long as the program of god in this side of his kingdom is concerned god will always need men you would hear expressions in scripture i sought for a man as a case study let's go to isaiah chapter 6. the bible begins the book of isaiah with a very interesting rendition prophet isaiah begins that book by giving several profound prophecies but when we get to chapter 6 and verse 1 6 and verse 1 the bible says in the year that king uzziah died I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Verse 2. And it stood, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain they covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Verse 3. And one cried unto another, saying, holy 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 is the lord god of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory verse 4 and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke now when isaiah saw this he was watching this in a vision he said woe is me for i am undone because i am a man of unclean lips and i dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts verse 6 then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hands which he had taken with the tongues from the altar and he laid it upon my mouth and said lo this hath touched thy lips and thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin purged and also i heard a voice of the lord saying Verse 8 is my verse of emphasis. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? This is a divine call from God himself. Look at the kind of glory and splendor that was described from verse 1 down to verse 5 how can such a great god look at the beauty of the seraphims themselves covered with six wings with two they covered their faces with two they covered their feet and with two they flew should such a god be in need of anybody isaiah said the whole earth is filled with his glory and that even his vision the smoke of his presence filled everywhere and instead of god making a declaration to say isaiah 
let it be known to you that i am god all by myself i can do anything i want to do i am alpha omega you would think that is the kind of sound that should come from such splendor and yet in the midst of that splendor the sound that comes out is who shall go for us who shall i send and who shall go for us and isaiah said here am i send me many believers wonder why in every generation it looks as if god just isolates a few people particularly as touching the fivefold ministry and then they receive such a mighty investment of his grace and power upon their lives doing great and mighty things for god throughout their generation while it looks like there is a crowd of others just scrounging to find relevance as far as spiritual things are concerned this troubled me for many years as to why a god that is so benevolent and lavish would seem to be so meticulous about the use of men until i found out that it took more than availability to be used by god so let's join you a bit to see a few of the factors that determine god's using a man because i can tell you in the southeast god is still looking for men in this nation god is still looking for men in the world today god is still looking for men we examined yesterday that jesus himself said truly the harvest is wide but the laborers are few and he left us with a recommendation he said pray ye the lord of the harvest that he will recruit more laborers hallelujah and god's recruitment system is about the strictest i am aware of in our world today there are many corporations that sometimes they call to receive um, new employees new staff structure and sometimes you see the burdensome requirements that they put you must have this number of years of experience you must have this range of qualifications and even at that it does not guarantee by itself that you will get the job and you can find out for a job with a vacancy of 10 or 15 spaces you can find as much as 15,000 graduates apply am i right on that and people invent all kinds of skills some use their uncles who are working there other people go to church for prayer other people consult shrines and everybody invents his skill to ensure that he gets into that place and at the end of it it looks like there are a few people who seem to secure that spot and if you go and ask the hr department they will tell you that they are a kind they may all be graduates they may be all certified but there are certain people that the corporation is looking for and the reason why those corporations have the standards that are desired is because they do not compromise on their standards god loves everybody but it's important for us to know that he is passionate about the fruition of his program and that passion is what has driven his strictness in the kinds of vessels that he uses and that he will use there are three requirements that the bible reveals as to the kind of man god uses the kind of vessel that god desires to use and i want you to please lend me your attention scripture starts by saying apostle peter teaching us nevertheless the foundation of the lord standard show it says having this seal that the lord knoweth them that are his then he says and let every man that named the name of christ depart from iniquity then he says but in a great house that there are four kinds of vessels in every great house number one vessels of gold number two vessels of silver number three vessels of wood number four vessels of clay and the bible says already by that description some vessels are ordained unto honor and some vessels are unto dishonor but that you can transit this is the good news that should be first um, peter i thought he was looking for it. okay second timothy now 
2 and let's do 20 and 21 second timothy 2 21 that was paul mentoring his son timothy but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver but also of wood and of earth and he says some vessels are unto honor and some dishonor now watch 21 carefully apostle paul is teaching us in this scripture that a possibility exists that you can evolve yourself from any level and any kind of vessel you are into the highest quality of vessels now scientifically clay cannot become silver clay cannot become gold wood cannot become gold but here is paul teaching us that in the spirit transiting in quality as a vessel is possible that i can start as a vessel of wood and a vessel of clay do you know the difference the difference in the quality of these vessels are only revealed in the presence of fire you never know how qualitative they are until you expose them to fire when you expose wood to fire it 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 just completely burns off when you expose clay to fire it breaks but when you expose silver and gold it becomes malleable enough to be molded into any shape you desire but there is no disintegration are we together yeah. so he's saying that these four kinds of because of the fierceness of the assignment that the vessels will be involved in he's saying there are some vessels because they have chosen to remain in that state their destiny will be dishonored eventually they will not last not because it is the will of god to keep them that way the quality of the vessel they have assumed does not have longevity in view are we together so he's now saying there is a condition upon which a man can evolve to become a more superior vessel and the key is found in verse 21 if a man therefore purge himself from these he says he shall be a vessel unto honor that means becoming a vessel unto honor is not just the will of god per se it is totally the responsibility of the individual vessel he says he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use and then prepared unto every good work may we be such vessels in the name of jesus christ i have studied great people who have been used by god in modern history and from scripture all in a bid to piece together the ingredients that truly makes a man usable by god i wanted that first for my life and then to be able to extend that information to be a blessing to as many who sincerely desire to be used by god i studied materials of men like tl osborne materials of men like lester sumrall great prophets who had gone to be with the lord consulted materials of our fathers of faith what exactly did god find in these men that made them greatly used by god and i came up with three keys and this is what i want to share this morning number one the first requirement non-negotiable demand that God must find in an individual to be greatly used by him is called the purity of your heart. Please write it down. The purity of your heart. In order of priority, I have worked with God a bit, I tell you with all humility, and I can tell you that this I have learned about God. The greatest posture that a man can take to secure the attention of God over your life is the state of your heart. 
the state of your heart vetoes your prayer life the state of your heart vetoes your fasting the state of your heart vetoes your bible study there is no other christian experience that is exalted higher than the state of your heart every other thing in your life as a christian activity only finds its relevance with respect to the state of your heart please understand this our world today is full of very sincere spiritual activities from fastings to prayer to word study to all kinds of spiritual activities and many people find out that the more they engage in these activities it looks like these activities carry a semblance of it, it, it's it captures within it the ability to bring them closer to god but in practicing these things they still find out that what they are looking for is truly not found because it is not found in activities is found in a state there must be a posture that any believer who desires to be used by god if you want to be used by god as a vessel i tell you the truth no matter what else you bring to the table if it is outside of the purity of the state of your heart god cannot do much with you do you know the reason why david earned a status in the bible called a man after god's heart i don't know how many times david had direct encounters with god but there are people in scripture who had greater encounters than david an example moses moses was called the meekest man but never called a man after god's heart look at the laborious assignments that was given to moses to take god's covenant people from egypt the land of captivity and to take them to canaan a land flowing with milk and honey god called him the meekest man and yet he never had that report that he was a man after god's heart how about other prophets who had great encounters with god not even samuel the mighty prophet was called a man after god's heart if you want to know the life of david and why god called him a man after his heart you go and study the entire life of david at the end of it you will almost be confused as to why such a man as to why such a man should be called maybe you may need to put your phones on silent please a man after god's heart how does he call a man like david a man after god's heart read your bible and see some of the atrocities that david committed read your bible and see some of the things that david went through the reason for uriah's death the reason for many other things that happened and yet among the many things that god could accord this man was the status of a man after my heart there are many names that god gives men god is not careless in naming men certain things he called abraham my friend you know what it means to be a friend of god we are not discussing that but do not downplay that status if a man is called a friend of god it is a very serious commendation there are some things that will not happen to you again when you become a friend of god for instance you cannot be lost again it is a privilege for you to be lost god will take you even if it's an untimely death but you will not be lost again it is a status and an honor when a man is called a friend of god hmm. hallelujah the second thing that you earn as the friend of god is that there is nothing he does within his program that he will keep you outside of that information that's what happened to abraham shall i hide this from abraham he had to come and tell abraham this is what i want to do to sodom and gomorrah and abraham says stop i have an interest there do not go yet there is somebody's interest that i need to protect and he literally negotiated the salvation of lot and his family the friend of god so you now understand what he meant when he told the apostles he said i no longer call you servants but friends they didn't even know what he was saying that is the reason why even in heaven 
the foundation of the new Jerusalem has their name the names of the 12 apostles can you imagine that let's get back to what we're discussing the purity of your heart let me show you a scripture second chronicles 25 1 and 2 second chronicles 25 1 and 2 a very interesting story about a king called amaziah we're going to read verse 1 and 2 together. Are we ready? 1, 2, read please. Amaziah was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jehoiada of Jerusalem. Now read verse 2 as loud as you can. 1, to read. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord but not with a perfect heart. One more time. What kind of a statement is this? How can you do what was right in the sight of the Lord? And then the Lord says, even though this was right, there is still a problem with it. The problem was not the correctness of the activity. The problem was the state of the heart that executed it. That a man can preach correctly and yet be found wanting in the spirit. A man can do evangelism correctly and still be found wanting in the spirit. You can build ministry correctly and still be found wanting. The Bible says, give us that scripture. <laughs> he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. But there was a, tr a problem. He was not a fake man of God. He was not a fake prophet. He was not a fake apostle. He was not a fake preacher. Genuine. You would come and see him preach and you would be so convicted by his message. And yet in marking his script, the Lord gives us the marking standard that beyond the correctness of a man's activity, the first thing that is marked in the spirit is the state of your heart. Never forget this scripture for the rest of your life. You can fast right. You can pray right. You can give right. You can preach right. You can do business right. And be surprised that in spite of the correctness of your activity, heaven still finds you wanting 